Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today we're going to talk about alcohol and what the difference is between alcohol use and alcohol abuse, which we don't use anymore. Alcohol is a part of American traditions, weddings, uh, get togethers after work, um, gosh, any celebratory events. But when is a healthy drink or healthy use turn into risky behavior? If you've seen my videos and you've liked them before, please don't forget to give me a thumbs up, subscribe and share the video. This helps me build my channel. So let's just go ahead, dive in and talk about alcohol. In 2024, the MMWR, which is a morbidity and mortality report that's usually published weekly, was published back in February 2024 discussing excessive deaths from alcohol use in the United States between the years 26, 2016 and 2021. The authors found that every year around 178,000 Americans died because of alcohol related causes. So that's around 488 cases per day. Now, men were more likely to die at similar ages than women. These numbers included all deaths attributed to conditions that were fully caused by alcohol use, binge shrinking and alcohol related chronic conditions that involved medium or high use. What's considered unhealthy alcohol use? So alcohol use falls on a spectrum with low risk drinking on the far left. And then on the far right, you have the development of alcohol use disorder. Now, over time, doctors have used different terminology, but this is the terminology that we're going to discuss, which is in most common practice today. Now, unhealthy alcohol use is an umbrella term. It refers to any drinking pattern that harms health, but isn't dangerous enough to be considered risky. This is a precursor to risky use. Now, risky use alcohol usually refers to a consumption of an amount of alcohol that does put the individual at risk for health consequences, but it's not severe enough to be labeled a disorder. Binge drinking is usually episodic drinking is drinking so much so that within two hours, the blood alcohol level rises to 0 0.08 grams per deciliter. In women, this amount can be achieved by drinking anywhere from four or more standard drinks. In men, it's five or more standard drinks. Binge drinking does have medical consequences and can lead to injuries from intoxication effects. And then finally, we have alcohol use disorder. There is a strict definition and guideline by the DSM-5 TR criteria. As physicians, we can't just slap that label on anybody. There are specific pattern traits that are described that lead to a clinically significant impairment or distress manif manifested by 11 specific psychosocial, behavioral, and physiologic criteria. Now, current terminology does not recognize alcohol abuse or alcohol dependence. It's alcohol use disorder or risky use. What's considered risky use? The National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism defines it clearly. For men under the age of 65, more than 14 drinks per week or more than four in one day counts as risky use. For women of any age and for men over the age of 65, it's seven drinks per week or more than three in one day. Now, a standard drink of alcohol means 14 grams of alcohol. That's five ounces of wine, 12 ounces of beer, one and a half ounces of spirits. And there's been shrinking. Now, how common is it? So this data was obtained by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. These particular results are from the 2023 National Survey on Drug Use and Health. The final sample of surveys did consist of 67,679 completed interviews, and alcohol use was found to be very common. Some bullet points include 79% of Americans have used alcohol at least once. 22% report binge drinking monthly and one in 10 will actually meet criteria for alcohol use disorder, but over 90% of these have never received treatment. Rates have actually increased since uh, 2020 and have risen, especially among women. Stress, isolation, and economic strain have all contributed. Let's try to get into why this happens. We'll discuss genetic and environmental factors. Now, the causes are complex, but may not be surprising for most people. There is a mix of genetics 
and environment. Some people are born with a low response to alcohol, meaning they have to drink more to feel similar effects. There's also the environmental factors such as parenting, trauma, social pressures, socioeconomic pressures, job losses, stress at work. There's also certain personality traits such as impulsivity, neuroticism, or extroversion can also increase the risk. Now, there are some genes that may exert a protective effect, such as the ALDH2 gene, which is often found in Asian populations, and this can cause a flushing and nausea after small amounts of alcohol consumption, which overall lowers intake. So let's get into common medical consequences, such as gastroesophageal reflux disease, or often manifested by heartburn and can cause ulcers. We have high blood pressure, pressures can get higher, sleep disturbances such as insomnia, uh, waking up in the middle of the night or having difficulty falling asleep or waking up and then not being able to fall back asleep. Abnormal liver enzymes are usually seen on blood testing. We've got bone marrow suppression where the platelets have difficulty in being produced and usually patients with long-standing alcohol abuse will have a deficiency in their platelets. They can have enlarged red blood cells which can impair function. We have heart disease, we have neurologic disease, some patients with long-standing alcoholism, alcohol use disorder can actually develop neuropathy, which impairs your ability to sense perception and change and can sometimes cause disabling pain. There is an increased cancer risk in GI cancers and breast. Now there's also psychological impacts such as an increase in anxiety and depression. And suicidality has also been known to be increased in those who consume regular excessive uses of alcohol. When it comes to the mortality and the suicide risk, excessive drinking is the third leading cause of preventable death in the United States. But here's the good news. Early intervention actually was shown to save lives. Most people do improve when the alcohol use is addressed in time. But simple, we ask. Usually primary care physicians in the office will screen every patient regardless of whether or not they use alcohol. In the hospital, I ask as well, and my colleagues do too, we're going to ask you about alcohol, not to be judgy or to put you in social categories, but to identify opportunities for counseling. We're gonna ask you how much you drink and how often you drink. Additional questions may be like times you've tried to cut down and what you've tried and what often are barriers to quitting. We're gonna ask whether or not drinking interferes with your relationships, whether at home or at work, and we may order blood tests. I will often care for patients who come into the hospital with elevated liver enzymes and, and knowing what your liver tests are can actually help us understand your overall clinical picture. But if the AST to ALT ratio is greater than two to one, I am thinking of alcohol and I may ask you a little more about that. Now, um, alcohol injury to the liver can manifest in elevated enzymes that can often go down. This is in short term, acute onset of injury. Longer standing alcohol will not reveal or correlate with elevated liver enzymes. Additional tests include GGT, PATH uh, test. It's not a test that I personally order. Blood tests can actually suggest alcohol misuse but can't prove it. We will use the behavioral criteria from the DSM-5 TR criteria such as cravings, tolerance, withdrawal, and the like. What happens after, as physicians, we've identified that there is a possible alcohol use disorder or risky use? We're going to counsel you. Most often, physicians will offer therapy, medications such as naltrexone or acamprosate. There is a form of cognitive behavioral therapy that often psychologists or psychiatrists will even discuss. There can be supervised withdrawal programs for those who are with severe use disorder. Whatever the recovery or treatment plan, it is tailored to the individual patient. There is no one size fits all approach. Let's recap. Nearly 30% of U.S. adults are drinking in ways that harm their health. Risky use means more than three drinks per day or seven per week for women of any age. And then it's seven per week for men above 65. And for those under 65, it's more than 14 drinks per week. Genetics environment, just your daily stress can play a role. Alcohol can damage nearly every organ in the body and it can increase mortality. Screening often and early can actually help institute recovery and it helps the patients overall. I'm Dr. Jamal. If you like this material, don't forget to give me a thumbs up and share. I'm here to make the medicine make sense. So follow me until next time.